Welcome to Afterwards. This is Eve Smith, and I'm here with Maria Bartiromo. Maria, great to have you here. Hi there, Eve. It's great to see you. Tell me, how did you, f let's start on a personal note. How did you first become interested in financial journalism? You know, I really think I fell into it. I wasn't uh, necessarily interested in, in, in college, although I was doing well in economics, so I studied economics at NYU. And it wasn't really until I started my career at CNN Business News, and I got a job as a production assistant, that I started uh, having a real interest in following the markets and mm -hmm. following the economy. So it started uh, at the beginning of my career at CNN Business News, and I moved over to CNBC five years later on camera. And I've always been interested in the economy, in following markets, and learning how, um, you know, uh, leaders of organizations, global organizations, uh, get things done. And, and uh, it's, I'm still very interested in, in finance. I love it. Terrific. Now, why, now this book, this is your first historical memoir. Why did you decide to take that approach this time? Well, um, you know, I felt that this was such an extraordinary moment in time. Uh, this is my third book. Uh, but as far as doing um, a piece on what was going on in our great country, I felt that it was uh, important for me to document it because I felt that I had a front row seat. I was able to interview literally the insiders uh, at some of the largest organizations and the most interconnected organizations every day throughout this crisis. And when I sat down to, to think about it, I realized this is truly an eyewitness account. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to uh, make sure to document it because I think that for the first time, uh, as certainly in my career, in my lifetime, uh, we faced a situation where we were very close to collapse. And I wanted to write about the back channel conversations, what was going on behind the headlines, what was going on in those private conversations that led to the decisions that were made on that fateful weekend, which allowed Lehman Brothers to go bankrupt, Merrill to be sold, and the government to take 80% of AIG. And that's why I wrote this book, because I think it's very important to truly understand what was behind those decisions made in order to understand and have a good sense of where we're going in this economy. Right, right. Now, you know, one thing that one concern that people sometimes voice about political cor political commentators is that many of the people they write about are social acquaintances, even friends. And some people have voiced the same concern about financial journalists. Now, you've covered many of these people for years. You know, how do you deal with that issue in your reporting and in an account like this? Well, I think there's always a balance. Um, it's true that I have seen a number of these people away from the camera and at events, at conferences, at social events. And uh, I think that it's a balance to walk to ensure that you're getting the information out that people want to know and need to know uh, about the players, about the stories, uh, but that you're also not breaking uh, off-the-record conversations and off-the-record situations. So I tried to walk that balance. Um, but, you know, make no mistake, I am talking with and dealing with the heads of finance, heads of state all the time. You know, we've got 200 guests on CNBC every day. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think that in order to truly do my job well, I have to have open conversations with people. I need to be able to pick up the phone and call the major players and get some answers. And oftentimes it will be off the record, but at least I can educate myself so that I can best communicate it to the public. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think it's actually helpful uh, to understand this world and know the players um, to truly uh, communicate how this world works. And that's what I tried to do in the book. Right, right. Now, you've talked a little bit about your process of the book. Can you tell us a little bit about just the o an overview, sort of the arc of the book? Sure. I begin uh, in 2006 when life was good, mm -hmm. uh, if you will, when individuals were taking out mortgages in many cases that they could not afford, when private equity uh, was doing deals with uh, enormous amounts of leverage, and uh, doing tens of billions of dollars deals and uh, not having any covenants. So it was very much uh, loosey-goosey time, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, it all came home to roost. So then from 2006, I s sort of s s take you through how things began to show signs of cracks. Mm -hmm. And then I take you into that weekend when Tim Geithner and Hank Paulson 
and called an emergency meeting at the New York Federal Reserve to talk to the masters of, of finance to try and figure out if, in fact, there was a way to save Lehman Brothers and if they would uh, take on some of the toxic debt, the uh, assets that had plummeted in value. And then I take you beyond the next year and a half uh, to some of the ramifications of that weekend mm -hmm. and the ramifications of the financial crisis all the way up until financial reg reform mm -hmm. when the uh, regulatory reform was passed to show what has changed and what I walk away from in this book is the fact that we have seen change I don't buy into the fact that it's business as usual once again I don't think that's true Mm -hmm. I think one of the major changes that we have seen uh, are, uh, well, a couple of things, but one of them is uh, the awareness of debt. Debt got us into this, and debt has hit a tipping point in terms of awareness. Whether you're an individual or an institution, you know that debt can be poisonous, and you know that you cannot borrow forever. And so the average guy out there today is talking about deficits and talking about debt. And I think that awareness is very important. And I think that's one of the major positive changes since the financial crisis. There are other changes as well, including much more regulation. The financial crisis empowered a new sheriff in town. And uh, the administration has put forth a number of proposals and new regulation that has curtailed some of the uh, practices. So we have much higher capital requirements where the banks are being forced to hold more reserves, uh, money reserves. You've got lower leverage ratios. You've got an individual today that has a much higher savings rate. So there has been fundamental change since this financial crisis and since that weekend, and there are others as well. Well, let me just play devil's advocate a little bit. I mean, you know, many people, you know, you correctly point out that many famous firms have disappeared, that we've had people are not very worried about debt. We've certainly had, we've had a reg reform bill pass. We have Basel III, which is, you know, close to being finalized. At the same time, we have tremendous unemployment and a lot of distress in the real economy. You know, your book's title is The Weekend That Changed Wall Street, and yet the average person looks at Wall Street and they still see multi-million dollar bonuses. Now, we're not through the financial reform on the institutional side, but we, you similarly you see on the credit card side, you know, that the number of forms were implemented and yet the banks are finding ways to circumvent that. I mean, how do you think that, how do you think the change of really, you've talked about many changes that have happened, but what's really changed with the Wall Street firms themselves? Well, the Wall Street firms are publicly traded companies that are in the business of making money. That hasn't changed, and I don't think that will change. Uh, these firms uh, have constituents that include shareholders, and I think that they will continue to try to be profitable, highly profitable, and make money for shareholders. I think what uh, will change in that regard is there's also an awareness that there are more constituents in addition to shareholders. There are employees and there are customers and there are communities in which they operate in. And I think there is uh, more of a pressure on boards of directors and on management teams to ensure that they are uh, beholden to those constituents. And I think uh, as a result of the financial regulatory reform, the, the credit card situation that you mentioned, the Consumer Protection Agency as part of FINREG, we will see more change. But when you're talking about regulation that takes out billions of dollars in earnings, of course that firm is going to look to make that up somewhere. And that's exactly what's happening right now. Mm -hmm. So you are going to see the banks look for new streams of revenue, given the fact that those revenue streams that may have to do with uh, practices that were uh, not, not very uh, positive for the consumer. For example, these hidden fees in the fine print about credit card uh, delinquencies. And if you're late paying a bill that your rate goes sky high that has been corrected as a, and will be corrected as a as a result of the consumer protection agency and so that fee income that the banks were getting uh, will come from somewhere else and there's no doubt that they will look for that so yes there has been a lot of change uh, but they're not going to change and go to become nonprofit organizations right. they remain uh, profitable organizations and they're going to continue trying right. to figure out how to make money there's right. no doubt about it right well, there's an expression I once heard in South America that they've changed their minds, but they haven't changed their hearts. Do you really, do you really feel that Wall Street gets it yet? That they, that they, you're talking about changes that you see that you know, the executives recognize that they have to ap appeal to more constituents. But do you see real evidence that they've internalized that it really needs to be business differently? Or are they still thinking in more of a? I mean, there's probably a spectrum, but what evidence do you see which way in terms of 
any any signs that that there's a real attitude change versus there's gee we have you know a bigger thicket of regulation and rules we have to contend with.